just a bit, a bit of a background because I was asked to talk about how the TCPS and how the BREB um, are um, giving consideration to qualitative issues in relation to um, research ethics review. And so um, the old TCPS, which was originally um, promulgated in 1998, had virtually no consideration of qualitative research issues in it. Um, it was primarily focused on uh, clinical issues and it was a huge bone of contention for the social scientists, um, humanitarian researchers, um, humanities researchers uh, in the country. And so in June 2004, there was a paper that was uh, written called Giving Voice to the Spectrum, um, which was um, an, uh, uh, basically a, a suggestion to the panel on research ethics that they really should start talking more specifically in the Tri-Council policy statement on um, qualitative issues. In uh, 2007, they um, conducted a consultation on qualitative research in the context of the TCPS. Then they issued a second draft um, in 2008, and um, finally in 2010, came up with um, a brand new uh, TCPS, which, amongst other things, has a full chapter on qualitative research. So my first dumb question is, has anybody here read Chapter 10 of the TCPS? Okay, a couple of you, good. So I don't feel too, too, too badly by saying, because a lot of what I'm gonna go into here is actually what's in the Tri-Council Policy Statement. So for maybe surprising to some of you to know that there's a chapter that's specifically on qualitative research in the TCPS, and um, that chapter recognizes that qualitative research um, is different, and um, that the approaches are inherently dynamic and often grounded in very different assumptions than those that shape quantitative research approaches. So the next two slides are right in the TCPS. They're not going to tell you anything you don't know because you already do uh, qualitative research, but I, I think you just need to know that this is actually articulated in the chapter. It's written um, in there and it's um, directed at um, researchers and REBs that they need to take into consideration these factors when um, reviewing um, a research ethics applications applications that involve this kind of an approach. So they talk about the fact that qualitative research involves an inductive um, understanding, a diversity of approaches, that it's dynamic, reflective, and um, a continuous research process. Um, it's quite often diverse um, and involves multiple and often evolving contexts, and often the emphasis is um, more on um, depth than on breadth. Um, that, uh, again, research goals um, are diverse and um, uh, so are the objectives. Sometimes the objectives are simply um, giving voice to a particular um, uh, um, uh, um, issue, engagement, empowerment, impacting change, etc. So this is stuff that you um, already know, but I just wanted to bring to your attention that it is in the TCPS um, and uh, so that there is an entire chapter devoted to that. Some in that chapter, there are some specific provisions that are directed at qualitative research. And so, subject to some exceptions, REB review is not required for the initial exploratory phase intended to discuss feasibility of research. So as many of you know, you do have to do a lot of that. Um, and there are Concerns, questions come to the office um, often as to whether or not they need approval and when they really don't know what they're doing and how can they go ahead and do that. The new TCPS specifically says, yes, this is permitted and um, it's understandable and it's necessary in the context of qualitative research. Um, the chapter goes on to talk about the diff different modalities of consent, um, the standard notion of consent of a, um, a written uh, document that's signed and witnessed and uh, formally gone over is not um, necessarily appropriate for um, most if, um, uh, uh, qualitative research. And so um, the chapter discusses the fact that there, um, that qualitative researchers use a range of procedures. Oral consent is often used, recorded consent, rec return of a questionnaire, etc. 
that within the context of um, qualitative research, consent is based, quite often the process is based on mutual understanding of the project goals and objectives um, between the participants and the researchers and that it's basically a partnership kind of um, situation. Um, and so um, the, as part of research ethics review, the REBs are specifically directed in this chapter to consider those broad range of strategies for documenting um, consent and um, their specific um, uh, provisions that says that under a number of circumstances, a signed written consent is not appropriate. So qualitative researchers don't have to go into their research ethics application assuming that the REB is going to ask or require that formalized informed consent document. Um, they have some specific in, um, provisions around observational research. Uh, they provide that observational uh, studies in public places where there's no expectation of privacy are exempt from REB review. And uh, observational research that doesn't allow for identification of participants in the dissemination of, of the results that's not staged and that's basically non-intrusive should always be considered to be minimal risk. Um, and where no personal information is collected, consent is not required. Where personal information is collected, the need to forego prior consent, which is often required as part of the observational research, um, can be allowed, it just needs to be justified. They need, you need to show to the REB that you've taken appropriate steps to ensure the privacy of um, your participants when you're not getting their consent. Um, with respect to disclosure of identity, uh, the, the default is not to disclose um, identity. Um, and in social sciences and humanities research, this is quite often the only re, um, real risk that is involved in the, in the study. But it's also recognized, again, right within the TCPS in Chapter 10, that in some types of qualitative research, respect for participants requires identification of the individual. So again, this is not something that um, the REBs are not accustomed to seeing and that it's not something that you can't be asking for. There's also specific provisions about emergent design. Um, Dean, uh, the Dean mentioned that um, these are some of the um, challenges that you do have. And um, so again, the provisions are that the REB has to be aware that in some types of research, it's very common for specific questions um, as well as um, shifts in data sources or discovery of data sources to emerge only in the course of the project. And REB should not be asking researchers to provide them with a full itemized um, one question one through 25 um, schedule of their questionnaire in advance of their data collection. So that is there. Um, as long as the, uh, um, as the research is being conducted in accordance with the methodologic, methodological requirements of the particular um, uh, field, um, they should be able to acknowledge, the REB should be able to acknowledge that questionnaires may change or need to adapt um, over the course of time. Um, so that's really all I've got to say about the TCPS. So if you're interested, read Chapter 10. It's actually not that lengthy a chapter, um, but it would be helpful if you knew it ahead of time before you fill out your application, because then you'll know some of the things that you can and cannot do. Um, the behavioral REB, um, when I was asked to do this talk, someone said to me, well, that's what the REB, that's what the behavioral REB is all about. They, they only deal with qualitative issues and that's their expertise. And so that in fact is the case. Um, we, um, we did do a forms revision um, in December of 2012. So if you haven't submitted a study um, since then, you'll find some new stuff in there. And we really made a concerted effort to try to divide the clinical form from the behavioral and to use more appropriate behavioral terminology. Um, we have updated the BREB guidelines um, so that they're more specific um, to behavioral studies. And of course, our BREB membership is comprised of individuals with expertise in, um, in qualitative research. And um, four of those members are from the Faculty of Education. So thank you very much to Monique, Teresa, Kay and Pat, so those are your sources within this faculty. And then I'm not gonna go into the list of the other people, but, um, but they're from film, theater, sociology, social work, psychology, family practice, etc.
I'm going to tell you about my personal experience of conducting my doctoral research, um, where ultimately I actually couldn't ignore that the interviews I was doing were becoming interventions. <clears throat> And by not ignore, I mean, first of all, I ended up doing a, a, a complete second reanalysis of my data in order to try and capture some of that process. Um, <clears throat> and some ethical issues uh, arose, um, particularly in terms of informed consent um, and also risk uh, to participants. So the interviews became interventions in a couple of ways. First, they had an impact on the participants' professional practices. I did my interviews with therapists. Um, and they had an impact on at least some of the participants' personal lives as well. So as I was putting together this, uh, um, this presentation, I had to laugh at myself a bit because um, I was Beth's doctoral <laughs> student and she has you know, scholarly expertise in ethics. Um, and she'd written this comprehensive article on qualitative research, um, which I actually can't believe is 10 years old um, at this point. Um, and to boot, my research was on the topic of professional ethics. Um, and so, you know, was this really such a surprise? I, I do want to say that yes, it was, because my book learning had taught me a lot about how to do qualitative research. But once I got out there in the field, it was very eye-opening. And things were unfolding, um, sometimes in ways that really were quite unpredictable. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, so I'm going to give just a brief overview. You need some context for what I'm going to be telling you about. So research, I'm going to talk about the results with a focus on the unanticipated analysis and results, and then I'm going to talk about some implications. So just to give you a little a bit of background, um, in the eating disorders field, um, there's been a lot of debate as to whether individuals, clinicians with personal eating disorder histories, um, should be involved in treating clients with eating disorders. And there's been some conceptual research, not research, articles more about like what are the pros and cons of this, what are the negatives and positives, but nobody had really taken a professional ethical lens to this question, so that's what my uh, research did. And I wanted to do some discovery-oriented research um, based on the perspectives of the participants themselves on the therapists themselves. So the research question was for therapists with a personal history of an eating disorder, what are their experiences of professional ethics and their day-to-day -day work with eating disorder clients? And the aims were to explore and understand these experiences, very qualitative, um, and to generate some practical knowledge as well. The method was interpretive description. It emerged from nursing inquiry. Um, it situates quite nicely in the constructivist, interpretivist paradigm of science um, with all those underpinnings ontologically, epistemologically, um, and uh, values-wise. In a nutshell, my participants were 11 female therapists who self-identified as having personal eating disorder uh, histories, and they worked in eating disorders uh, treatment. The duration of the eating disorders ranged from about 2 to 28 years, um, which is not uncommon. Um, and their recency of recovery, they stated, was sort of between 3 and, and 29 years. They were also highly educated and uh, quite seasoned, most of them. In terms of data collection, I conducted three in -person, two in-person interviews with each participant um, at their workplace. And that's a cop topic of a whole other talk. What's that like? Um, that's another ethical consideration, doing interviews like that at the workplace, um, and then a telephone follow-up. This was over a course of eight months. Um, and the main interview question was, tell me about your um, experiences of professional ethics and your work with eating disorder clients. That's really broad. That gives participants a lot of leeway to figure out for themselves, hey, what does ethics even mean to me in the context of this? Um, I took copious field notes and I did a lot of reflexive journaling. And that's, I want to highlight those because they became really important in why I did a second analysis and, and what emerged. Data analysis, I'm not going to go into in a lot of detail, consistent with qualitative research, inductive, moving from a process of describing to interpreting. So to the results, <clears throat> there were uh, two sets of results. The first was kind of a descriptive results section, and that was a result of a manifest content analysis. And I expected to do this manifest content analysis. I thought, you know, what are their ethics experiences? And participants told me, indeed, their eating disorder histories seemed relevant, ethically relevant to their work, um, and in, in those particular areas. And this is currently in press. But where I want to focus the rest of my talk on, I've got to skip ahead here in my notes. 
is the second area of results, uh, which I had not anticipated um, at, the, at the study's outset. So as data collection was progressing and analysis was progressing, and different questions were emerging as per the emergent design, um, I was starting to conceptualize the conversations themselves with the participants as being an ethics experience. So not necessarily an ethics experience in their day-to-day -day work with eating disorder clients, but an ethics experience, a new um, ethics experience sort of born of talking about those issues. And this realization really came forth for me in the reflexive journaling piece um, and in the field notes I was taking uh, before and after each interview. Um, <clears throat> so there were a couple of things that came out. Um, the interviews as an unintended ethics intervention, okay? So the interviews caused participants to think about their ethics practices in their work with eating disorder clients and they made changes um, to their ethics practices and to their clinical practices. And secondly, the interviews, I think I knew this going in, but not really. It's only when the process of, of interviewing was happening that I realized how professionally and personally risky a topic this was um, for the participants. Ethics itself is a scary topic <laughs> for a lot of us professionals. It brings to mind, you know, complaints and review boards and things like that. And certainly a personal eating disorder history was a, a risky topic. And then I'm going to talk about how some participants were actually triggered and I'll explain what that means later. I'm gonna take a principle-based ethics approach here. I really encourage you to look at your codes of ethics as a first line, always. Um, but I'm gonna talk about uh, my work in terms of a principle-based ethics approach. So, what were the things? What, what were the unintended, how did the unintended ethics intervention work? Well, the participants examined their personal eating disorder history vis-a-vis -vis their clinical work. They reflected on um, and made changes to their self-disclosure practices, whether or not they disclosed their personal eating disorder history. They felt more confident. Um, they beefed up on their ethics continuing education and they stopped basing clinical decisions based on their own personal history. So that's like major thumbs up. That's, that's awesome. That invokes the ethical principle of beneficence. And I think the, th the participants would agree with me that they, they came out of this process feeling more confident, prepared, knowledgeable, and perhaps objective um, and helpful clinicians. But, and there's always a but, um, we need to keep in mind our other principles here. So non-maleficence, autonomy, and fidelity. Um, and I also want to bring in the notion of informed consent. And so Cavail, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, talks about when we enter as a participant into a research interview, we go in probably expecting to give some personal information, but we might not be expecting to have an experience of changing the way we think about ourselves or an experience of changing our behaviors. And so how does informed consent like, what does that even mean in that situation? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the specifics of how that happened. Um, in my study, so some ethical questions that emerged for me um, emerged around consent, harm, um, and was I being faithful, um, invoking the principle of fidelity. So did participants consent to entering into a change process regarding their ethics practices? Well, I don't think they did initially. Um, so, you know, there were measures that I took, which is the idea of ongoing consent, um, which has been uh, mentioned already. Um, qualitative research is emergent. Um, this is a hallmark of qualitative research. Um, on the plus side, I also uh, reviewed consent at every interview um, and the, white, the right to withdraw participation completely or the right to omit data. Um, and I often checked with participants, is it okay to be talking about this? Okay, and then I consulted like crazy. <laughs> with Beth, a lot, and other people. Um, Another question, could the interview becoming an intervention have been harmful to any of them? And I think the answer is yes. Okay, people felt embarrassed about having had a blind spot about something. They felt humbled. Um, they expressed feeling a little bit embarrassed and exposed. Um, and so the measures that I took um, 
were that I asked explicit questions about the previous interview. Was there anything that happened that felt uncomfortable or that you wish that you hadn't talked about? Which is a great question for making the implicit explicit, but then it also opens up a whole can of worms, right? Do you now want to be talking about the thing that you didn't want to be talking about? Um, I also actively tried to undo shame, convey non-judgment. Um, I affirmed their courage and honesty uh, with me. I, again, offered to omit data, reviewed consent, right, right, right to withdraw, and a list of counseling resources were provided up front and other supports. And another question is, in the emergent data collection and analysis, was I being faithful to what par participants had consented to? Um, and I think the answer to that is I think so. I think Beth's article, 2005 article, does a really good job of talking about the concept of trustworthiness um, of researchers. So I, I endeavored to be responsible, trying to promote participant welfare, trying to guard against their harm. And it was hard sometimes because there was really juicy stuff coming out at times and I was excited and I had to really ask myself, is this really relevant to my research question? Okay, moving on to interviews as professionally and um, profession personally risky. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of discomfort um, around this vulnerable intersection of topics. So ethics was scary. People talked about it being ambiguous, abstract. People would say to me, do you think I'm talking, is this, is this ethics? Am I talking about ethics? They laughed, they fidgeted. Um, they wanted to seem competent in front of me, they said. Um, and one woman said, you know, this whole topic just brings up ways to screw up. So it's a vulnerable topic. Um, and then personal eating disorder history, also very risky. I had one participant say, you know, I have this intense desire to tell you that I'm not, I'm not symptomatic anymore. I don't have an eating disorder anymore. Um, and they also talked about perceived stigma in the eating disorders field um, against people with personal eating disorder histories and persecution at the workplace. And then finally, um, being triggered. So for a couple of my participants, um, the initial interview um, in talking about the intersection of their eating disorder history and their work awakened dormant parts of themselves, right? One woman, woman talked about it's like smelling something familiar. It wakes up the eating disorder part of my brain that loves to be obsessed. Um, so she talked more about having more thoughts present. Um, another participant actually uh, purged a few times. Um, if you're familiar with that, that means self-induced vomiting. Um, so are we into pretty a little bit of dangerous waters here? I, I think we are. The questions, again, were around benefit, risk of harm, and consent. Was there any benefit to participants in becoming more mindful that talking about their own eating disorder history and how it influences their clinical work could increase their vulnerability to their personal eating disorder? And I think possibly there are standards in our ethics codes which require us to keep on top of our physical and mental health and to make sure that's not impinging on our work with clients. Um, and the measures I took around that were like asking people, what was it like to realize that? What, what's it like to realize that maybe, hmm, you know, I thought this was dormant and yet I'm still having some of these thoughts. And by and large, uh, most people said it increased their self-knowledge in a positive light. Was there increased risk of harm in talking about this? Yes, clearly. We had an increase in eating disorder-related thoughts and behaviors, feeling vulnerable about ethics in general. And in terms of the measures, I explicitly explored the degree of risk with some of these participants. I, I found out gently, you know, getting supervision, are you, get, are you consulting? Um, people would spontaneously say, oh, and I have a therapist and I'm dealing with this. And, um, and we, again, explored ceasing participation in the uh, interviews uh, or in the project and removing data. And then a list of counseling resources again and I consulted like crazy. Did my participants consent to experiencing a change in their view of themselves in terms of their degree of personal eating disorder recovery and their ethicality? And again, I don't think initially. So again, very emergent, and the measures taken were the same around the informed consent about the other issue. So I have some takeaways for you. Uh, participants can be vulnerable, and th that can mean participants that you don't think are vulnerable, like my co-therapists. I, I think I underestimated the degree of vulnerability there, and we need to promote their welfare and guard against harm, just like any other participant we would be working with. As best you can, try to anticipate how your interviews could function as interventions. Um, you also might get some really interesting uh, data and analysis out of that, and Breb will help, I think with that. Um, understand that your counseling skill set is going to influence participants' level of disclosure. You are, if you're in a counseling program here, you are going to be able to elicit information that, that a lot of other professionals wouldn't be able to do.
become acquainted with the literature. Please, please be familiar with their codes of ethics. And if any of you, any of you are doctoral students in the counseling psych program, I really suggest you get on your code of conduct for psychologists. Um, I'm studying for the jurisprudence exam right now, and I wish I'd had more exposure to that code of conduct um, back when I was uh, in, in training here. Um, reflexive journaling, field notes, and then of course, consult, consult, consult. So that's, uh, that's my message I'm going to leave with you. So thank you. As my title suggests, I, I want to focus today in particular on ethics and the experiences of research participants, which is oftentimes a somewhat neglected uh, area. So that's where I'm going to um, focus my attention. But very briefly, before I get into the content of what I want to say, I just wanted to say a little bit about what I, I do in my research and my teaching. I am a medical sociologist by training and moved into applied ethics as a postdoc and since then have been engaged in doing interdisciplinary health research, almost exclusively qualitative research on a number of topics. Uh, for many years I did work with people with Huntington's disease, which as you may know is a very serious neurological disorder, and I was very interested in the experiences of people having genetic testing for Huntington's disease. And this slide comes from an experience I had during my doctoral work when I worked as a volunteer uh, every year at uh, Camp Squamish, which is a, a wonderful place where we would go on a retreat and we would have about 15 or 20 people mid-stage with Huntington's disease. We did art therapy, music therapy, all kinds of things that in their everyday lives people no longer had the opportunity to do. So it was a place where people took a lot of risks and it was very exciting to see how they would blossom in this really short time together. And I was very moved by being part of that and, and found myself um, in the role of camp photographer. So I took photos like this and, uh, and this began to make me think a lot about uh, what we do as research and how it feels to be a participant. And I became extremely uh, sensitized to what it was like to be taking photographs of people who have these involuntary movements and feel really quite self-conscious in front of the camera and the degree of trust they were showing to me in allowing me to take these photographs. And I thought a lot about this and wrote a lot in my field notes about this experience. Um, and it certainly has uh, stayed with me and informed a lot of my interest in ethics and qualitative research. So as I said, very little attention has really been given to understanding the experiences of research participants. And I think this is particularly important in qualitative research. At this particular juncture, uh, we're seeing a lot of new and innovative methods, things like digital storytelling, uh, photo voice, found poetry, theater. I mean, it's a wonderful time to be working in qualitative research because there's really a blossoming of methods. But it also means that I think we need to pay renewed attention to what the experiences of human subjects are in some of these projects. And just as a very brief aside, if any of you do research involving visual methods, I was on sabbatical over the last year and uh, one of the projects I was involved in in Melbourne was creating a set of ethical guidelines guidelines for people who do um, visual research. So I'm very happy to share that with you. Uh, I have limited hard copies, but it's a free uh, downloadable PDF. So I think there is then at this point in time a real need for evidence about what's happening to our research participants. And this, is, I think, is something that's also really important from the REB member standpoint, in that many people who review qualitative research never really get to hear what happens to the people who participated in the studies they've reviewed. And especially with these innovative kinds of methods, I think it's becoming really important that we as researchers document the kinds of things that happen for our participants and share that, not just with our colleagues in research, but also with people who work in the uh, ethics review boards. So here we have what I think is somewhat the typical picture right now. Uh, most of the attention in research ethics is focused on the, the overlap or the interaction between researchers and the research ethics committees. And research participants, ironically, are somewhat on the periphery here. I really want to see that change and have research participants become a much more meaningful part of this whole process.
So my key question then is how can we ensure that experiences of research participants inform our system of human research protection? And I have just a few things I want to share with you on that and then I'd love to hear some more suggestions. This slide is just a title slide for a project I've been involved in for about the last seven years called Centering the Human Subject. We had a grant from the Canadian Institutes for Health Research to do what was quite a large uh, study on the experiences of human subjects in health research. And this is everything from clinical trials through to interview studies to kind of community-based uh, interventions. So the full spectrum of different kinds of research with the intent really being to understand what happens to people. Are they respected? Do they feel adequately informed of the, res the results or the risks of the studies they participate in. And furthermore, how are these experiences interpreted by researchers and research ethics boards members? So we are doing a kind of triangulation to see is there really any significant um, correspondence between what actually happens to research uh, participants and what we as researchers think goes on for them and likewise for the research ethics boards. So this was a really important um, thing for us to begin to ask about these topics and it was ironic to us and kind of surprising really that in this day and age given how much attention has been given to developing codes of ethics and appropriate methods of review that no one had really yet gone out and talked to research participants about their experiences. So I want to focus here on one example of a finding from the study, which was to do with the unexpected impact uh, of participating in survey research, something we would normally think of as being uh, a minimal risk kind of approach. This woman that um, is quoted here, and I'll read it aloud in a moment, uh, was a participant in a study on arthritis and the effects of arthritis on the ability to parent effectively. And she's talking here about what it was like for her to complete this very lengthy uh, questionnaire about her experience as a parent. She says, how much do you hurt? How fatigued do you feel? How do you feel? Do you feel like you're being a good mom? Wow, after a while, yeah, you feel. Am I? Do I? Wow, I'm more tired than I used to be. It surprised me how sad I felt after, how fatigued, how much things hurt, how my life had changed. Reflecting on how I was three years before when I didn't have the disease. So when I finished the whole survey, if I recall, I cried. I had a couple cups of tea and I don't do that. My rule is I don't have pity parties. It's just the way my life is now. I move on from that but I was very sad when I finished the survey. Which I think you know, goes in some ways to the same point you were making too about uh, these things becoming interventions when really we intend them just to kind of objectively observe in some way. And, and that seems like when you hear these kinds of testimonies, such a naive kind of assumption. Yeah. Another woman in our study and this became the title of a paper subsequently because it was a real pivot point in our study. Ethics is not only for the researcher, it's for the people participating in the research too, you know. Because we think it's all about us and how we behave and how the ethics board sees what we do. But our participants go, hold on a minute, it's about me too. And many of our participants in this study talked about what it meant to them to be a good participant, to live up to what they promised to deliver, whether that was you know, showing up at the clinic every week for half a day and having blood draws and tests done and paying extra for parking, Whatever it entailed, they wanted to be a good participant. And I'm sure we can all relate to that. We know how much people try to give you what you need during an interview, for example. So this was a real eye-opener for us. And, and when we had this interview and we started looking at the data, we changed course and we started asking people a lot more about what they thought about their own ethics as a human subject. This now goes to another point. This is a a piece of visual art, a representation of some of the findings from our study. 
which was done by a fellow from um, education, Donnell O'Donohue. I'm sure many of you know Donnell. Uh, he was working with me in a team that convened to look at alternative ways of disseminating the findings from this particular study. We wanted to share them with a much wider audience. And so we created a piece of uh, performance. It was a, a kind of ethnodrama woven in with music and found poetry and visual art. And this is really about the importance of sharing our findings with the communities that they came from because we staged this twice here at UBC and had people from our study come and be part of that event. And this was one of the panels of visual art that appeared that came in fact from the exact words of some of the interview transcripts. So I'll just give you a moment to look at that. One of the biggest complaints participants had in our, our study about researchers was they didn't share the findings of their research. They wanted to know what happened and they never heard. So that was a real bug. So let me just conclude then by underscoring a few things about valuing uh, participant perspectives. I think the first thing is we can all do this. It's very simple to, to ask participants about their experiences of their involvement in our research and how it could be improved. And that's something we can tag on at the end of an interview or a focus group or a survey. And it's very helpful sometimes. Secondly, uh, I think we, we, we all need to remember that methods that are sometimes deemed minimal risk are not necessarily minimal impact. Thirdly, I think we should expect that our participants will have their own perspectives on what is ethically appropriate for themselves and for researchers. Fourthly, it's really important to share your research findings with your participants in an appropriate and timely way. And lastly, I would greatly encourage you to publish your stories of ethics and qualitative research because we all need to hear about what's going on and so does the REB. So I'm going to talk about this in a slightly different way. Um, taking into consideration my colleagues and the work that Breb does, and please don't misunderstand when I say that ethical research is impossible. Uh, I, I'm not saying that the work that Breb does isn't vital and the work that other folks do, but I'm speaking theoretically and, uh, and epistemologically that I don't think ethical research is possible. I think it's a desire but not a possibility. And this harkens back to the literature on representation and the, the crisis of representations. And that this notion that we can, you oftentimes will read in qualitative research that lovely paragraph, I call it the paragraph. The paragraph in qualitative research that will say, I am a X, Y, and Z. Um, and oftentimes that means dominant culture folks will say, I am a white middle class, heterosexual, able-bodied woman who understands that these positionalities impact my research. ba -doom boom <laughs> And then that's it, right? The rest of the research oftentimes does not take up those issues. So when I say ethical research is impossible, I'm pointing to the fact that what I'm saying is ethical research is impossible because that paragraph is never enough. So I work towards being an ethical researcher. Uh, and for those of you who work in communities like I do, working towards means I work towards allyship. I am not an ally. I work towards being an ethical researcher. This means to me that I do things like design research with communities and participants, that I don't walk in the door. I'm an ethnographer by heart and by trade. And so the piece in the beginning where you said that we don't have to have ethics before we go and make some of those relationships. Ethnographies with communities uh, following protocols, whether you're talking about First Nations or other communities, relies on relationships with the folks that you're going to be working with. And that means asking people, what do you want? What do you need? What can I do? What can I do to help you because we all know that we're going to benefit. We're the researchers, we always benefit. We get PhDs and tenure and grants and all of those things, which isn't a bad thing. But what can I do that means that this research 
does something else besides what it does for me. Um, contextualizing research with communities, in communities, in place, in space, in context, in protocols, and in locality. So oftentimes I teach a lot of research methodology courses and I really love teaching them. Um, and I think one of the things that I talk about a lot is the pieces that we read are wonderful, but you need to have them contextualized to understand whether they're applicable to what you are doing or what you desire to do. Place, space, context, locality matter. Particularly if you are entering into communities that are not your own. And even when you are entering into communities that, you're all, that are your own, but you for ha perhaps look like me and are working with communities that are of uh, different ethnic and cultural and racial backgrounds. So understanding something about where it is that you're, you are standing. Thinking to yourself, why these communities? Why these people? Who do I want to work with and why? And am I the right person? to be doing that research. There's a really funny thing on YouTube, to, uh, and I pardon my French, but uh, shit visual anthropology students say, and if you haven't seen it, you should look at it. <laughs> and one of the things that you see in this very particular period in this very cute little video um, that is that the field of interest in this moment of this particular video in visual anthropology was everything having to do with um, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, and that everybody wanted to do research in sexual orientation and gender identity. And right now, for the work that I do, I'm seeing everybody wants to work with trans youth. Um, and my question is always, what are your relationships to the communities within which you think you're going to do your work, and why do you think you're the right person to be doing that work? And it can't be because it's the coolest thing going. Also, because if you're a doctoral student five years from now, it won't be the coolest thing going anymore anyway. But why are you walking into communities? Why are you talking to particular people? H have you thought about that? Have you thought about the impact of who you are on the work that you do? And again, for those of us who are, have complicated positionalities but are part of dominant cultures, why is it that you think that in your dominant culture self that you are the person to do the work? You may be, but you also may not be. Thinking about notions of speaking with, but also listening to. We all want to, as qualitative researchers, uh, do speak with. But listening to is a skill that some of us have to develop over years. And because it's so hard, particularly when you're a student, you're trying to get data. I'm afraid I'm not going to get my data. I'm afraid I have nothing, right? And so sometimes I'm teaching a video ethnography course right now, and we talk, we're talking about data analysis last night. And one of, the, one of my students said to me, well, he didn't say anything I didn't already know. And now what do I do? And I said, listen again. And listen for what they're not saying as much as what they are saying. Because I'll bet you anything, if you look at your questions and the way that this person spoke with you, that there's something there that you didn't expect. You just don't know it yet. I work with, mostly with youth and I work mostly with marginalized youth. But I'm saying here there is no youth and there is no marginalized youth. Because there is no body that is that marginalized youth. There is no body that is youth only. There is no body that is only trans youth only or queer youth only. We don't actually know what those words mean and the discursive systems within which you all work, if that's your theoretical bent, help you make sense of who it is to speak of youth or children or students. And one of the things that we fall into oftentimes is using bad student, good student, right? And that at-risk students, or marginalized students always become the bad student get compared to the good student. How do we as researchers think that through in a way that forces us analytically, both at design, at data generation, and at data analysis, to employ notions of complication? There is no universal, essentialized identity of youth. So what do we do with that? And how does that help us? Representation, whose stories and when we choose to discuss, and some of you spoke to that. 
I'm and always have worked with youth that don't always have the most comfortable relationship to laws and rules. And that means that I have to make decisions and you as researchers have to make decisions as you go about what's appropriate to get out into the world and what's inappropriate to get out into the world. Um, and only you can make those decisions in the field. But oftentimes, in a previous study, I was working with a lot of youth that were uh, involved with the courts. And they would do things like come to, uh, and that was when I was still teaching, they would come to class and they would have, I don't know, driven a car that they've stolen to class um, and parked it three blocks away. We had lots of conversations about how smart that was. Um, but also, did that was that an important piece of the research process for me to have a conversation about? Was it an important piece of the research to let uh, rituals and traditions of certain communities out into my research? It's not always, and I will turn and ask the folks that I'm working with if, if that is an appropriate piece of information to get out into the world. And sometimes they will say yes, and I'll still think it wasn't a good idea, and I won't include it in what I do. So I'm not, from my theoretical stances, I'm not interested in getting it right. I don't think there is such a thing as validity. I don't think there is a, a, such a thing as objectivity. Um, I'm interested in questioning norms and binaries. That doesn't mean that I'm not interested in rigor. It doesn't mean anything goes. And if uh, there are some of my students in the, in the room, they will attest to that fact. But I'm asking, whose norms am I thinking I'm looking at? I have notions of norms. What are theirs? I found that I need to understand in deep ways how I think about concepts such as truth. We're doing qualitative research. Truth. Let me just say it one more time. Truth. Uh, power, knowledge, and identity. First thing I ask students to do in my courses oftentimes the first day is to write down what do they think their definitions of power, knowledge, and truth are. The room gets really quiet really fast because there's a really complicated things, but I think we have to look at those to understand how we approach research. Um, and I'm interested in questioning norms and binaries in order to try to get away from notions of validity, authenticity, and generalizability. I want, uh, I want me, as a researcher, to think about how is it that my work is believable, usable, provocative, but I don't believe that because I work very hard at doing, I'm in, at the tail end of a four-year ethnography right now, uh, that I think that you're going to be able to take what I say about this particular ethnography and generalize it out into the world. Um, I don't think that's the function of the research that I do. It may be the function of the research that you do. And I just want to put this up here for students. Uh, as I was working through this again last night, I was just trying to think of the people that make me happy. Or when I teach them, um, I teach them over and over again. And so those are some names of, of folks that I work with. I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say about all of this. Um, uh, we don't get these opportunities very often, so I thank you for listening.